Brian May, it's great to have you with us today, sir. Thank you, Sophie. So recently, um, I was going through the glass beat game of Hesse, and oh. he writes about music. And what he says about music is that except it's art form, it's also a true power over nations and human souls. And then many people say that exactly why music is compared to exact sciences, like math. Um, see, I never really got that, because I, I finished piano conservatory, and I always failed my math class. Now you, as a man of music and science, can you tell me how music is related with science or exact science like math, for example? It's a hard question. Um, yeah, obviously, obviously there are mathematical things in music, but ironically, I think the most important things in music are the instinctive things. So I don't know quite how that works out, except maybe it gives you a balance. But yes, I love pure science and I love pure music. And um, they're not the same, for sure, but um, certainly throughout history there, has, there have been connections in people who, who were immersed in both of them, you know, from Leonardo da Vinci to, to Patrick Moore. You know, there's, uh, it seems to be that way. Maybe it's an abstraction thing. Maybe people who like these things don't like the clutter of the world, don't like the complications of the world that we live in, you know, these, these pieces of stuff. They just like to find the, the essence of life. So maybe pure science is in some way close to the essence of nature, and music is close to the pure essence of human beings. At this point, do you see yourself as a man of science or a man of music? Um, depends on the day and the hour. <laughs> do you believe in God? There's a man called Richard Dawkins there who is a very strong atheist. Yeah. I had a little kind of argument with him in, in the 108 minutes because he, he kind of, I think he felt that he proved there was no God and my feeling is that's not a very scientific attitude because if you, if you make a pronouncement you have to have evidence. So if you say there is no God, where is the evidence there is no God? You can say I don't know, you know, being an agnostic to me is, is a scientific point of view which is supportable. But you know, he's a very clever man, he has a different point of view to me. But it, in my experience, I have felt at times that there is a God of some kind. I don't subscribe to any religion, organized religion. That's a different matter. But if but your question is about God, I think maybe there is a God. But if there is a God, we have very little idea of what that God might be. That's inherent in what we are. We have very little understanding, I think. Um, do you think we're alone out there? Um, it's only opinion. I have a strange feeling that maybe we are alone. I don't know why this is, you know. But you, you, you've spoken about the loneliness that you experience after each performance. Um, and it's funny enough because I've spoken to a couple of astronauts who've been to the moon uh, for the past three days, and they also speak of that fast loneliness that they experience when they're out there in space. Um, does space and music, in your opinion, give you that comfort of loneliness? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, maybe they do for a moment. Yeah, maybe. Th I ironically, again, maybe that's what makes you more aware of loneliness because you glimpse this contact, you glimpse this wonderful togetherness with people or with the universe, and then the reality is you lose it. So maybe that's why. Uh, maybe that's why we feel lonely. Yeah, I do feel a lot of loneliness. But is it a comforting feeling? No, it's not comforting. <laughs> but music when you're in it for the moment, and science when you're in it for the moment, is all-encompassing. So yeah, you don't have time to think. I always wanted to ask you that, because earlier in your life you obviously abandoned uh, uh, explore, exploration for celebration. Was it sex, drugs, and rock and roll? What was it for? Fame? Money? It was never for fame, because I don't particularly enjoy fame. It was never for money, because I was always happy with what I had, even if we only had fish fingers. Um, it's just because it was there, I suppose. It was exciting, it was unknown, it was a door that you thought you could walk through. But then, 30 years on, you went back to finish your PhD that you'd mm. dropped out from. Why'd you do that? Um, it was unfinished business. It's like you have a circle someplace and the circle just doesn't quite make it back. Task accomplished. But it, it, it didn't have to do anything with feeling of guilt towards your parents because you dropped out earlier on in life and maybe they're a little disappointed in you because you went off to rock and roll? Yeah, there was a moment. You know your stuff, don't you? <laughs> yeah, my dad was very against it in the beginning because he, 
I think he saw in my education and the place I had got to, the place that he would have liked to have got to. He never got his degree, so it always held him back in his life. So he saw me with this fantastic degree in, in, in science and a whole world opening up to me and it looked like I was walking away from it and he, he found that just impossible to compute. So yeah, he was very upset and we hardly talked for about a, a year or so, maybe more. And um, various things happened, but eventually he came to see us play. Um, and he said to me, I understand now, I understand why you had to do this. And the funny thing was, you know, he was very against this, but all the time I was doing, starting off with Queen, he was drawing little maps and, um, and charts of, of how the record sales were doing and everything. You know, he was following with great detail uh, what I was doing. So he was always kind of into it. He just didn't perhaps want to uh, say that to me. But okay, when, um, obviously when you think Queen, you see you playing next to Freddie Mercury, all those great hits come to my mind, and then you understand that when you reach that level of success with someone, you definitely like have a special bond, you form a special bond. And I've heard you um, in another interview say that you still see Freddie in a strange way. Can you elaborate on that? It, it's like a family member. You lose them, but you don't quite lose them because you, you take them with you. Yeah, and we were so long together that um, you get that closeness with somebody, particularly in a creative environment. I don't think fame has anything to do with it, or even success, but in the creative environment, you, you learn to, to know what somebody else might be thinking. You, know, you might not always be right, but you have a feeling for that. You know? So I still feel that, and Roger does as well. You know, it, it particularly, it applies more if we're working as Queen, in a sense. You know? And we think, ah, oh, what would Freddie say? And you go, ah, oh, probably he would say this. <laughs> Um, yeah, he's part of the creative process because he's part of what we are because we really chiseled this thing out all together, me and John and Freddie and, and Roger. So, I mean, for a while I didn't want to know, you know, I was very, um, there was a point, you know, the grieving process where I just didn't want to talk about Queen, didn't want to feel that it was there even, except as history. But I sort of got through that and now I regard it as part of my life which will never go away and it shouldn't go away really because it's it's a big part of what I worked to create to fashion what do you think happens after death after death you all the big questions isn't you mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know I don't know um, I'm inclined to think that our view of the universe is very simplified you know in a way that um, you know a beetle crawling over a piece of paper has, has a very limited view of the universe. I think we also have a limited view. So this existence that we know may be just a very small part of the whole picture. You know, and um, I'm excited to think that that may be so. Um, I'm not counting on it, <laughs> because maybe, maybe at the end of, of your life that's it. I don't know. Uh, you know it, it, one thing is certain, you can't use it as an excuse. You can't say, OK, you know, this life is really bad, but the next one's going to be okay. No, you have to make the best of where you are. Sorry, I can't not ask you. I know that you've been very successful, and yet you, you, you were on the verge of suicide. What stops you at that point? Is it fear of death or love of life? Ooh, yeah, I've had very bad depression, yeah, which a lot of people deal with at certain points. Um, what stops you killing yourself? I think what stopped me was the fact that I had children and people who depended on me and people who loved me. Um, and you just think, it, in, a, in a sense, it's a very selfish thing to kill yourself because you make so much mess, you know, you, you do terrible things to the people around you. That would have been awful for my children. Um, and maybe, yeah, I would like to tell you that there was a glimmer of hope there, but there wasn't at that time, no. I remember driving and, and seeing the bridge and thinking, I could do this. And I just thought, no, it would, it would make, you know, I have to somehow discover what, what is going on. And, yeah, it would be a bad thing to do because of the, the people around me. And you come out more empowered after that once you've actually... I think if you do certain kinds of work, you come out more empowered, yeah. And I, di I did kind of chuck my life in and check myself into a a depression clinic, uh, which was actually the best thing I ever did because it was a new start. It's like restarting your car, you know, and I had to ditch my preconceptions and that work definitely gave me a new uh, 
a new energy, yeah. It wasn't instant, but it gave me the tools to deal with life in a slightly different way. I think you have to get to the point where you throw everything away uh, because that's the only way you can make a new start, you know. I realized that if I did not deal with the depression, I was no use to anybody. So it's the same kind of logic as not killing yourself, you know. Killing yourself is really bad for everybody around you, but also staying in depression is very bad for everyone around you. So it's no use struggling and trying to keep doing what you've been doing the whole time because it's, it's going to be the same thing. You know, you have to somehow get outside and trust that you can come back in as a person who can deal with things again. Mr. Mate, you've got all the money you want. You're an educated man. You love staring at stars. Would you consider maybe flying by them as a space tourist? You know, I don't like being a tourist. It's funny that you say that. You know, if I was flying and there was some reason for it into space, I think I would enjoy it more. It's like being here. I keep busy in my life, and, I, and it's quite hard for me to take a, a week off just to come to Tenerife, although I love Tenerife. But, but there was an excuse to come here. I had work to do. I had things which could be achieved. And I think that's made me enjoy the sunshine and, and the beach more, the fact that I'm sort of part of the life of this island. I mean, I, I love this island anyway, and it's because of the work, really. It's not because of being a tourist. So, you know, if there was some reason to go into space, if I thought it would um, stop people torturing animals, I would do it then. <laughs> but I would enjoy it. Oh, you've spoken to some of the brilliant brains of uh, our times for the past three days. Who do you think, who do you think could be or is high priest of the 21st century? The high priest of the 21st century? Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Um, maybe Nelson Mandela, because <laughs> he has a very important key, I think, apart from wisdom and knowledge. He has the key of forgiveness, which I think saved his country completely from a bloodbath. And I think if all the people who run this planet studied under Nelson Mandela, then we would definitely get a better planet. So I think that would be, more than anyone else, I think he has the key. Ryan May, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you.